Hi, uh, so good afternoon. So today the main topic would be on LiDAR sensor and data processing. So we will just go through the agenda first. So the main topic is what is a LiDAR? What are the various sensor technologies that are available? Then we'll have a look into the LiDAR basics. And then what are the different types of LiDARs that are available in the market? And also what are their use cases? How are they used in these various uh, markets? Then we will look into the growth of the LiDAR industry, mainly in the automotive side, and then how they are used in autonomous vehicles. Then we will go towards some actual approaches. So mainly state-of-the-art LiDAR processing techniques and also looking at some of the machine learning, deep learning side with object detection, semantic segmentation. And then we look more towards what is currently in the market in terms of SLAM that is used by uh, use uh, that is using LiDARs. And finally, we will see some, what are the various jobs that are available in the market. And yeah, we will also have a short demo about uh, about how the LiDAR data looks and certain small algorithms and a small demo of how LiDAR can be used. Then we will have a small Q&A. So now we start with what is a LiDAR? So a LiDAR is basically stands for light detection and ranging. It is a time of flight sensor. So LiDARs are called time of flight because they emit their own electromagnetic waves and they read its reflections. The time of flight or between the electromagnetic wave being emitted and read back is used to calculate the distance, the direction and orientation is calculated using the phase. So LIDARs are called active sensors. The main reason is uh, an active sensor is one which produces its own energy source. So if, if you use a camera, for example, a camera perceives what is already there in the environment. It does not throw a signal out to detect what is there in the environment. So an active sensor has an advantage that it produces its own energy source, so it can work in more unique conditions where a sensor, a passive sensor cannot work. This uh, LiDAR being a time of flight sensor and also being uh, very high in resolution makes it one of the fastest growing sensors in the industry right now uh, with the advent of autonomous driving and so the image you see on the right is basically of how an active sensor would behave. So you uh, you provide a electromagnetic signal and then you capture its echo or reflections. And LIDARs usually work in the infrared, near infrared region. So they are not visible to the eye. And yeah, so this is a basic of what, are, what all are there in LIDARs. And then we look next into the various sensor technologies. So currently in the market, you may have already noticed that there are already a lot of sensors available. So the most common sensors in terms of autonomous vehicles, which is the main focus of the topic is radars, cameras, and ultrasonic sensors. They have an advantage that they have been in the industry for already a few decades, especially radar and ultrasonic are already used in the automotive sector for cruise control, for parking assist. Cameras are also being introduced now and they are also very stable. And since most of these sensors, all of these sensors are static sensors in the sense that they don't move, they don't have any moving parts. They are very easy to package and very easy to uh, integrate into vehicles. LiDAR is the newest sensor that's entering the market in terms of uh, being integrated into vehicles. And yeah, it is basically, it has, it has a few advantages over each one of the existing sensors but also it has a, a few disadvantages. So we will mainly look at this in the next slide. Here, basically we have the four main sensors, cameras, radar, ultrasonic, and LIDAR. The first thing you will notice is the dimensionality. So cameras, monocular cameras usually work in uh, 2D. Then you have radar, which perceives in 3D. Uh, new generation radars, old generation radars are usually 2D. Their elevation is uh, elevation detection is uh, pretty bad, but modern radars can detect also elevation. So they are 3D sensors. Ultrasonic is one dimensional. It basically tells you the distance between you and an object. And then you have LiDAR, which is 3D. Then you have the sensor type, whether it's active or passive. 
radars, ultrasonic, and lidars are active sensors, whereas cameras are passive sensor. And lateral and longitudinal is basically in which uh, dimension are these sensors very good at. Camera is very good at detecting objects laterally, so uh, but they do not perceive depth really well. So this is uh, their advantage is that they are very good at lateral uh, tracking objects laterally. Radar is very good longitudinally. That's why it is used in autonomous driving for like cruise control and so on. Ultrasonic sensor is not good at either. It's a one dimensional sensor. So it just tells you a distance. LiDAR has an advantage here. It's very good at lateral as well as longitudinal. And the next part is the cost. So this is where the LiDAR usually loses out right now in the market is that LiDARs are usually very expensive. And this is where the industry is trying to make the LiDARs cheaper and with better production methods, you can reduce the cost of the sensor. The next one is the environment conditions and what environments do these sensors work best? So cameras work best in day, daylight scenarios and clear skies. Cameras suffer from reflections, uh, shadows, the position of the sun with respect to the camera. So if the sun is directly facing the camera, the light source, this would create, uh, this would cause the camera to degrade. Radar has the advantage that it works in all weather scenarios. It does not uh, it is not affected by fog or uh, rain, snow. This is one of the biggest advantages of radar, which is why it is used ex extensively in uh, safety applications and uh, vehicles. Same goes to ultrasonic. Ultrasonic usually is used for very close by scenarios. So when you're trying to park a car or when you're uh, in a traffic jam to see that you're not getting too close to the vehicle in front or behind you. LiDAR can work in most weather situations, but usually struggles if it's very foggy or if there is too much rain. Strong rain can cause the radar reflections to ref uh, diffract, so you will get uh, wrong readings of objects. In terms of precision, camera is very precise in terms of lateral positioning. A radar has low precision, mainly in sense that it cannot detect too many objects. It also has uh, a of a higher uh, devi standard deviation in terms of where the objects are detected. Ultrasonic is even lower than, is the lowest in terms of uh, precision. LiDAR is a very precise sensor. It can very accurately detect objects in terms of uh, X and Y and in height. So this is one of its biggest advantages. And in resolution, again, cameras and uh, LiDARs have very high resolution data. So in terms of camera, you can have a five, six megapixel camera, which can give you a very high resolution image of the environment. So you have very good pixel densities. Radar has an issue that it has very few uh, data points that you receive from the radar because they have a lot of reflections, they have a lot of noise. Ultrasonic sensor suffers from the same. LiDAR has the advantage that it has a very uh, clean and high resolution input that it can provide to the user. And then we go to the range. Cameras usually work well to like 50, 60 meters. Uh, this is purely from uh, auto autonomous vehicles, automotive sector view. So 60, 80 meters in very good conditions is possible with a camera. Radars are usually the best in terms of range. They can detect objects up to 200, 300 meters away. And ultrasonic is very low, five, five meters is usually the range where they would use an ultrasonic sensor after which it's not very useful. LiDAR falls exactly in between the camera and radar. Around 100, 150 meters is very, very doable for most uh, LiDAR sensors. And then finally is the frequency. So how quickly can we get data from the sensor? Cameras have the biggest advantage here. So you have automotive grade cameras that work at 20, 40 hertz, which is which may seem pretty slow, but for automotive grade with uh, with uh, global shutter cameras, this is good enough. You get a high resolution image, and you also give enough time for the chip on the camera to do object detection and so on. Radars usually run at very low resolution, uh, very low frequencies. Five, ten hertz is the usual standard. 
Same goes for ultrasonic. And LIDARs, uh, mechanical LIDARs run at 10 hertz usually, but the new flash LIDARs uh, or solid state LIDARs also run at 30, 40 hertz like cameras. So this is one place where LIDARs are improving with the new solid state LIDARs. The next thing we will look at is uh, some of the basics of the LIDAR. So what a LIDAR contains. So any LIDAR has a laser and a detector. The laser is the, is the part which sends out the echo or the EM waves. And the detector basically returns, uh, checks the reflections from these lasers. And usually for LIDARs and for LIDARs, you have multiple reflections. So uh, very high-end LIDARs can detect up to four or five reflections. So this, let it, uh, this lets it detect a lot of uh, properties of the object, for example. And also, it can also measure the intensity of the returning light. So this is useful for understanding what kind of surface we are looking at and what kind of uh, properties does the surface have. So for example, dark colors will not reflect that fast with the LIDAR, but a metallic polish, for example, will work very well with the LIDAR. So these are uh, some of the properties that the LIDAR can detect and also yeah, so this is the main uh, inputs that the LiDAR provides to the customer. So you get a position of the object, you get the intensity of the object, and the intensity of the light of the object can be used to detect what kind of object it is. Next is uh, we look at the various types of LiDARs. So we will go through each one in a, a small detail. So mainly we have airborne and terrestrial. Airborne is where most of the industry has been using LIDARs in the past. Terrestrial is now where they're using it more and this is where it's entering into the autonomous vehicle sectors and so on. So when we look at airborne, we mainly have uh, terrain mapping. So this is uh, uh, airborne LIDARs, they're used to detect the uh, track the surfaces. So this is used, for example, to study uh, the cloud coverage it's used to detect how a storm is evolving. For example, you will see a lot of these uh, weather forecasts where they see how this uh, storm is expanding or how it's growing. What is the density of the clouds? So on can be detected using a LIDAR. You can also map forests to see what is the forest cover. And these are also very useful to detect if there are a lot of pollutants in the air because these airborne LIDARs are very high powered. They have very high resolution. They also consume a lot of power and usually the lasers from these lidars are not eye safe there that's why they are uh, used at very high altitudes and this the lidars can also be used to map the ocean surface this is called uh, bathymetry here and this is also a place where before it was usually done only with sonars and nowadays you can use lidars to get very very high resolution maps of the ocean surface this is useful if you want to do offshore drilling, for example, you need to know how, what is the surface that you want to drill into and using such uh, high resolution LIDARs, you can also detect the kind of object it is, what is the density and so on. And this is very useful so that you don't have any disasters while construction. This is a small example. So basically you attach the airborne LIDAR basically at the bottom of an aircraft and then you fly it over the surface and it basically collects the data and then you do data processing. And this is, for example, how they can create a map. So basically it tells you what is the depth of the water in this case. And this is one of the very uh, novel use cases of LIDARs. This is somewhere where other sensors would just not function. Next is we have terrestrial, or uh, this is the other main use cases of the LIDAR. And in terrestrial LIDARs, you, you have two types. One is static and the other is mobile. Static LIDARs are the ones you will see a lot of construction companies use to measure the, what is the position of the plan, uh, position of the systems where they want to build and so on. This is uh, very accurate and it is also used Currently, if you are playing video games, for example, you see very high quality uh, maps for 
cities like Paris or London or New York or San Francisco. These are done using uh, static lidars. So these lidars are placed in, a, in the city. They are given some time to map the surroundings. They remove all the dynamic objects and only the static buildings, trees, uh, traffic lights, traffic poles, these are stored in a map format and then these are directly converted into 3D meshes. And then for these 3D meshes, they do photogrammetry to stick textures and then you end up with a full 3D map for the player to play around. So this is a very big industry now. It is also used for mining geology to, uh, to detect what kind of uh, minerals are present in the soil and so on. It is also used for uh, mapping caves and uh, these static lidars have the issue that you have to place them in a particular place, let them scan for some time and then move it to the next place. So this is one of its problems. And then it's also again, not eye safe. And these are usually also high power consumption compared to the next uh, type. So this is the latest trend is the terrestrial or uh, mobile lidars. And the terrestrial lidars are, these are mainly used for autonomous vehicles. They are more rugged in design. So these are not very delicate, so they can be, uh, placed in front of cars, for example, in front of prototype vehicles, they can fall down or they can so they can have dust or uh, water on their lenses and they will still continue to function without degrading too much. They are very compactly designed compared to the other LiDARs you see here. They don't need a tripod. They don't need a lot of power cables. They are not high power consumption and they don't have complex lens and mechanical systems. They are also low resolution relative to static lidars or airborne lidars for example uh, airborne lidar can give you around like four or five billion points per scan per uh, uh, per square meter or something like this so this this resolution is not guaranteed for terrestrial uh, mobile lidars they usually work at around 100000 points or 80000 points per scan they also suffer from uh, most of them are mechanical solid state is newly entering the market but it's not yet in a very mature state so mechanical lidars have moving parts so basically the sensor the laser and the detector are one piece and then they rotate about an axis and as they rotate they scan uh, they scan and create a point cloud of the environment one more advantage of the terrestrial lidars the mobile lidars is that they are real time they are supposed to provide you the mapping as you drive. So this is where this is why they're used in autonomous vehicles. Uh, they cannot do any processing offline. So next we look at basically how the LiDAR industry is growing in terms of autonomous vehicles. So five, 10 years back, you didn't have LiDARs in the market in terms of vehicles that are using it. But nowadays, this is basically the trend. So most companies, big companies are trying to integrate LIDARs into their systems. And they are also used a lot in robotics. If you have seen like Boston Dynamics, for example, they can't, they, most of their uh, robots have a LIDAR. You will always see this rotating Velodyne LIDAR, which is on top of these uh, robots. Then you have the solid state LIDARs. This is the main, LiDAR that the automotive sector is depending on. This is the one which is reducing the cost. It re so a solid state LiDAR has no moving parts. So since there are, there are no moving parts, they can last longer. They require very normal packaging. So you would package it like a radar, for example. And these will last longer without having a lot of uh, mechanical uh, parts failing. You don't have to worry too much about maintenance and they will be more reliable than mechanical lidars. And also with the advent of faster computing, so you see Tesla using the new uh, neural computing that they have, you see a lot of startups coming up with different uh, uh, AI chips that can process uh, sensor fusion data at very high bit rates. These computers make it possible for uh, data processing to happen at a faster rate. So you are able to process 100,000 points, for example, which 15 years back would be impossible. 
a radar, for example, can only work with 100 objects or 1,000 points at most. So because of faster computers, we are able to use better sensors. And this is where the LiDAR as a sensor is entering the market. We see how the market has grown. So if you see in the past, in 2019, for example, you see that the total market value for LiDAR is around 1.6 billion, and it's expected to go to around 4 billion in 2025. But the more important thing is you see how the robotics and ADAS, so ADAS is uh, Advanced Driver Assist Systems. This is what is used in most cars. So level one, level two, we will talk about these different uh, autonomous driving levels in the next slides. But you see, this is where most of the market is growing. And the reason why it's growing, expected to grow most in the autom automotive sector is this is where you have volume. So for example, in robotics or wind or mapping, you don't have, you don't sell millions of cars like you do in the ADAS systems. So every year you sell millions of cars if the, pro if the cost of the sensor reduces, your market uh, cap increases. So, and here we see also what is happening with the LiDAR market share. So around 20, 25 years back, you didn't have many competitors in the LiDAR market. So most of you will probably be familiar with Velodyne, for example, or SIC and Valio, but these are these new startups that are coming up. So Trimble, they are usually GPS experts. They are also entering the LiDAR space. Then you have LiDAR Tech, these are startups. Waymo from Google. Then you have Faro, which were basically static LiDARs, but they also do uh, mechanical LiDARs for uh, autonomous vehicles. And then you see how it has grown in just one year. You have uh, newer companies. You have Auster, which is doing, which also pro provides lidars, which are very similar to uh, Velodyne. You have SI, which is a Chinese company, RoboSense, also from China. They make very, very similar lidars to Velodynes. So, since the product is very similar, but the cost is reducing, you have more competition in the market, which means it also reduces the price of these sensors and also makes it more viable for industries to use them to make better products. And this is where, this is how slowly LiDAR is being integrated into customer products for autonomous vehicles also for, and, and also when we talk about autonomous vehicles, it's not just cars, it's used mainly for buses, trucks, construction companies where they have to send vehicles to mine to collect uh, ore and so on. And also it is used in places where you want to do indoor robotics, warehousing. So you have these huge Amazon warehouses where these robots need to go pick up packages, move them around. These are places where you have a lot of dynamic objects, very high movement. And these are places where LIDARs are entering and they are more reliable than the other sensors we saw before. Next is, uh, how are LIDARs in, used in autonomous vehicles? Why is it now becoming a trend? The first one is high resolution. This is something where uh, other sensors struggle. So cameras are usually, they have only a monocular camera. And because of this, you don't get sufficient depth information. You can get depth information, but you have to make a lot of assumptions. So if you have a single LIDAR, which, uh, which you place in the same position as the camera, you could get higher resolution info. And also this is more uh, easier to fuse into the sensor fusion level. Next is uh, integrating LIDARs into the low level sensor fusion. This is also an advantage that the LIDAR data that we receive is very easy to read and interpret. This is something where radar struggles because radar points are not very easy to understand. And if you can understand what the sensor is providing at a low level, this makes it easier to come up with novel algorithms, how to fuse them, how to use them with respect to another sensor. And one more area why, where LiDAR is growing is because you have a lot of 3D computer vision from cameras. So doing 3D object detection, 3D semantic segmentation, 
and the same approaches that is used for cameras can directly can directly be used on lidar data so you have to if you create a neural network that works for cameras a 3d object detection on cameras the same network with minimal changes will also work on lidar point cloud data and one more advantage is that you get high resolution 3d with very less noise so if you take a camera for example and try to do uh, try to gauge depth and you will see that most of the times you have a lot of noise in the output in the output point cloud and you can improve this by having a wider baseline using stereo camera or using multi view cameras but you will not be able to get the same high resolution that a single lidar can provide for the same cost so this is one more reason why they are becoming more and more useful in the autonomous driving space and then finally you have that the lidar is complementary so if you have a system for example which has a camera and a lidar you could use the lidar to get the 3d information of the of the objects and then you could associate colors or do classification on the 2d image and project it onto the lidar 3d points so a lidar sees a car but it doesn't know whether it saw a car you can do object detection on the 2d camera image which is faster and then project this information onto the lidar point cloud and you can say there is a pedestrian walking or this car is in front of us or there is a uh, there is a kid in a trolley and so on another very good use case is uh, lidar and radar radar is very good at providing velocities so it can tell you what is the velocity and orientation of a vehicle and a lidar can give you the position of the vehicle the radar can give you its orientation and velocity to a very high degree so you can fuse the radar data's velocity into the lidar point cloud and you have actually increased the information that the single sensor was providing so you have high positional accuracy from the lidar high accuracy of velocity information from the radar and now we are able to fuse both of them together so this is where the complementary behavior of the lidar is very very useful then it's also in terms of how can how can we go to this dream of reaching level 5 fully autonomous self driving conditions so i guess most of you are aware of the six levels of autonomous driving so level 0 you do nothing the driver is in complete control of the vehicle at all times level 1 this is what we have in most of the cars so for example it can control the vehicle speed uh it can do lane keep assist as long as the camera can detect a left and right lane that you are driving on it can try to center the car and it can also do stuff like uh also detect in like you need to brake or do while parking whether there is a car behind you with a high resolution this is level 1 level 2 is mainly where you do for example uh, cruise control but acc cruise control so adaptive cruise control you can also do emergency brake assist which is now a requirement for future end cap scenarios so from 2022 onwards that you need basically all cars in the in the eu should for example uh work in this situation so in this case you need the sensor to detect uh, objects which are occluded so if a person is standing behind a truck you should be able to detect that there was a person there and then this person can enter the lane and then brake on these situations and then also uh do some basic autonomous driving you start at level 3 most of the industry doesn't want to do level 3 they do something called l2 plus so l2 plus is basically providing l3 but without the legal uh, issues that come with l3 so because in l3 the vehicle is in full control in some situations monitors monitors the road and traffic and will inform the driver when he or she must take control so this aspect of when the driver can take control and this relay from the system to the person has a lot of legal rules so to avoid this most of the industry will go with something called l2 plus which is basically do everything here till 
detecting the road and traffic, but will not do this part. It will expect that the driver is still in complete control of the car and they are responsible for anything that happens. This is what you see with Tesla's autopilot, uh, with Daimler's uh, cruise car, highway autopilot cruise controls. This is the same thing you see with BMW, for example. Then you move to level four. This is where you have uh, the Waymo uh, lift and cruise, uh, GM cruise, where they do what is considered uh, autonomous driving in restricted scenarios. So for example, Waymo works only in Phoenix, Arizona, and in some parts of California, where they have a very high uh, cost to run the system. So what they do is they have to map the environment on a day-to-day -day basis, and then they will let their cars drive only within a small part of the city, completely autonomous. And then you have level five. Level five is where the sensor suite and the computing should do everything on its own and no human driver is needed. And this is the final state that we expect vehicles to reach. And this is probably 10, 15 years from now. And for this to happen from level three to level five to happen, LIDAR is one of the most important sensors in this field. And the for level five, you have companies like Nuro or uh, Amazon also trying to do this in warehousing terms. They also purchase, uh, they also own Nuro now. You also see Waymo trying to do level five. You also see uh, Argo from Ford trying to do level five. And you have a lot of startups which focus on level five, but it's very rare that you will see a automotive company do anything above level three. So the BMWs, Audis, uh, Mercedes, all of them will focus only on level two, level two plus because level four, level five requires a lot of industry maturity. Next, we move to state of the art. Uh, state of the art is basically what are the latest uh, algorithms, trends that are happening, that are being used, that are using the LiDAR sensor. So you have uh, mainly object detection and classification. This is where the machine learning uh, is being used the most. So most of these uh, systems which were used to detect objects and classify objects in 2D in single camera frames can also be used in 3D, can be used to detect objects also in uh, 3D point clouds, or you can also do the reverse. So you can take a point cloud from a LiDAR, stack them, to create an image, a 2D image, but this will obviously be a very uh, small image in terms of uh, number of pixels. It's also used next in SLAM. This is where uh, LiDAR finds its biggest use case in, in the automotive sector. This is where you use uh, the LiDAR to create high resolution maps of the cities, of rooms, of buildings. And LiDAR has an advantage that you it includes scale because it gives you 3D information. And if you pair a LiDAR, for example, with a very basic IMU, you can do very accurate localization of the, of the vehicle in its surroundings. Then you use it for segmentation. This is now a very important task, which is also being done by many automotive companies. They try to do, uh, once you get the high definition maps from the SLAM, you use it to do segmentation. So this is then used to, in real time, detect where the lane is, where you have the sidewalk, where you have different traffic signs coming up, where there are trees, where there are buildings. So this usually for slam, after slam, you usually go towards segmentation. And low level sensor fusion is, which is, uh, which is currently being done in most companies right now. So if you look at uh, most, the uh, I and OEMs, they mainly work on low level sensor fusion and state of the art is mainly left for uh, research companies or small scale startups. And in low level sensor fusion, you basically try to fuse as many of these sensors as possible. Uh, we will see in the demo how such a complex system can exist, how they work and how they can be used for SLAM, for example. 
Additional stuff is online calibration between multiple sensors. This is also very important. So when you want to provide precise navigation, you want to provide precise maps of the environment, you need to have state-of-the-art calibration available. This is so that you always know that if you're driving, for example, in bumpy roads, you cannot assume that the ground is flat. So for this, you could use the LIDAR to detect that there is uneven surfaces, then use this unevenness to compensate for the camera calibration. And this is a very important topic, mainly when you want to improve your precision of these systems, especially if you want to use it, say, in, for example, if they want to use rovers in Mars, they will need to have very highly accurate sensors because you don't want to send something there which doesn't work and then try to correct it afterwards. And one more important part is mainly in automotive space is latency compensation for LIDARs. So LIDARs usually run at say 10 Hertz, most of the mechanical LIDARs. So these mechanical LIDARs usually rotate about their axis, but you have the situation that you're driving say at 60, 70 kilometers per hour. And as you drive forward, the LIDAR is also rotating. So you have to compensate for your lateral motion, longitudinal motion, and as well as the rotational motion of the LIDAR. So without having a very good latency compensation between what you're seeing and reporting them in one single correct coordinate system, this is very important to perform highly accurate uh, maps. If this is not available, then for example, the SLAM and segmentation would be completely useless. So this is also currently being worked on, especially at high speeds. So if you're driving in autobahns, for example, you can drive at 200, 250 kilometers per hour. And at such situations, if a LiDAR is running only at 10 Hertz, you need to know how to compensate for this. And this is very important. And then we basically look at some small examples of what are the state-of-the-art networks available. So in terms of... Uh, Object detection, if you look at uh, some of the latest metrics, you have the SVGA net, which basically uses voxels. So voxels are volumetric pixels. And this is used to uh, do object detection in 3D. This basically helps to a 3D point load, for example, is very hard to process at real time. So you make it into quantized voxel grids, and this makes it easier for you to process them at higher, at, higher res, at higher speeds. So this is one of the latest works, and this is basically how they do it. So you take a series of 3D points, you put them into, you treat them as one small cluster, and then on this cluster, you do object detection. This is done using the usual deep learning methods where you have to calculate the loss, you need to provide training data, and so on. Next is semantic segmentation. This is uh, where LIDARs are very useful. They can, this is usually done with respect to fusion with another sensor, but you can also do semantic segmentation with just the points from the LIDAR itself. And the LIDAR also provides intensity values, and this is very useful for semantic segmentation. So you could use this as a input for your network. So for example, asphalt will have a different intensity than uh, concrete uh, sidewalks. And this can be used to learn. And these are some of uh, the different ways to do it. And usually you have some data sets. The Kitty benchmark is one of the world famous data sets for doing uh, benchmarking your uh, deep learning or object detection or uh, SLAM. The last one we will look at before we move to the demo is uh, SLAM. So the SLAM here is called uh, LOM. This is laser odometry and mapping. So what happens in this is, this is currently the state of the art once you have variations of the LOM, but here what happens is they take a 3D point cloud. They try to find edges and corners similar to how you do uh, feature detection in 2D images, and then use the position and orientation of these points across multiple frames to calculate what is the trajectory of the vehicle. And this is used to create high density maps. We will also see this in a demo. And for example, this is how you can generate a high resolution map on the Kitty dataset. 
this is using the same uh, LIDAR data, but this is using a different uh, algo called the M MULLS. And you also see how, for example, the MLOM works. So you have uh, high resolution LIDARs. You can stick as many LIDARs as you want together as long as you have good calibration. Good calibration. And then you have to do some data pre-processing. You don't want to process all the points. So you will remove some noise. You will do some feature extraction. For example, remove the ground plane, remove trees, remove uh, dynamic obst obstacles. Then you do frame to frame motion estimation. If you have an IMU, you can skip this. The IMU already does some motion estimation for you. And then you try to align it with your previously seen. So some uh, data association, and then you build a map. And for every map that, so every point load that you align, you have some uncertainty. And then once the uncertainty is above a certain threshold, you real, then you basically reset. So finally, we look at what are the various jobs you have in the industry. So the biggest jobs is uh, sensor fusion engineers and perception engineers. This is not limited to computer science. Uh, this is not limited to autonomous vehicles, but it's also including robotics and also in warehousing and so on. So for a LiDAR engineer, you usually have someone who knows how to process LiDAR data, fuse them. You have various job opportunities in the market. Then we look at a demo. So for the demo, we are using this uh, Kitty data set. So here you see we have a system where we have a lot of sensors. So we have two cameras, a gray, a grayscale images, two color cameras. We have a Velodyne here. We have a GPS and IMU, and we also have the world coordinate frames. So I will go directly to the demo, I think because we are running out of time. Then, so let me just, so for the demo, I'm mainly using uh, ROS. Uh, ROS is very useful when you want to, for example, uh, so this is the kitty data set. So I will just show how it looks by adding how, for example, you how easy it is to perceive uh, camera data, for example. So what you see here is the LIDAR, the full 360 degree view of the LIDAR. And for example, you can see very easily that it's not that hard to detect objects. So this is very clearly a car. And this is also a car. And you can also, for example, use the image here and use the image to map it to the vehicles. So you see this car here, you can map it to the car in front and say that this is a vehicle. And then you can also use it to detect trees, foliage, where you can drive, where you cannot. For example, you can clearly detect where the footpath is. So this is the drivable space. And then you see this click in the graph. So this, this basically can be used to detect that you are now seeing this footpath and we also can see, for example, IMU, and let me also add GPS. Then for example, you can see what is the IMU. This is basically what is uh, from the IMU sensor. And let me, now when, then you also see the velocities of the car. So this is, the car is moving forward and you can see the, the vector for the, and then you also see the rotational parameters. So this is usually the best way to work with sensor fusion data or to work with LIDAR data is usually with ROS, if you want to prototype algorithms and so on. And so, yeah, yeah so this is basically the data set. So we can, for example, see how the SLAM works, for example. Then let me 
languages. So here you see the first big difference you see is that the map is static. In the previous one, we were moving with the car. Here, this is where the car starts. So this is where our base frame starts. And then you see we are building a map of the environment. The colors you see, this uh, purple, blue, green, and red is basically elevation. So blue means it's closer or below the ground. Green and yellow is an R range. Red is height, it's slightly higher. And for example, you can also see we already have the GPS in the car. So you will think, why do we need to have a map? Why do we need SLAM? So here, for example, if you see uh, the odometry, let me see. So if you were using just the odometry, you will see that we are already so off in terms of drift. You see, it assumes the car is going upwards. It assumes an elevation. It also assumes that positional error. You can see how far off it is. This is almost 10 meters in error. And this is not even a big distance. We have not even traveled more than a kilometer and you can see how far we start drifting with the sensor and this is where having a very good sensor fusion system and slam can help and you can see that the map is also flat this is because we are driving in a flat environment and yeah this is one of the biggest use cases for lidars you will see a lot of companies selling this as a product with the lidar itself and yeah, this is the big demo. And I can also show just a second. So here, basically, we are trying to look at this, uh, how to do, for example, uh, filtering of the LiDAR data. So here you see that we have the full LiDAR data. This is very dense. So we don't want to process all these points, especially for the ground plane, for example. Then what we can do in that case is we can just filter these points. So I can show you how this looks. So currently none of the points are being filtered. So this is the full LiDAR data as it is. And now if we want to quantize it using KD trees, we can quantize the LiDAR point loads. You see how much uh, the density of the points has reduced. So the very thin points are the actual LiDAR data. These uh, squares are from our filtering. And we can increase the leaf size, basically the KD tree clustering to reduce it as much as we want based on how much our computers can process and so on. You can also, for example, say how many points are allowed. Yeah, so this was basically the demo. And these are mostly the algorithms that are used how to visualize how to use the LiDAR point clouds. And yeah, that is uh, mainly the session. So I would then thank you 